Nine years. I can't believe how much time has flown by. Uh, when I started here nine years ago, I was just a young kid coming out of college, full head of hair, single guy. Nine years later, I'm married to my beautiful wife, Michaela, and I have my two boys, Henry and Charlie. A few less hairs though, gone through many Gatsby standards, and I don't know uh, what to tell you if the Gatsby standards have made me pull out all my hair or if it's the two little crazy kiddos that I have at home. But the good news is, is that today, the Gatsby standards that we're gonna talk about are a lot less in depth than the Gatsby standards that a lot of you have been implementing over the past few years with Gatsby 87 for leases and Gatsby 96 for speedas. Those were definitely more challenging to get through. The ones that we're gonna talk about today are still important and they still may affect you. Um, but they, they're definitely less in depth than those previous standards. And so it gives us all a little bit of a breather uh, when it comes to the standards that we are having to implement into your uh, financial reports. So with that, I'll get started here. The first, uh, or the two standards that we'll be talking about are GASB 100 for accounting changes and error corrections and GASB 101 for compensated absences. The first one we're gonna talk about is gonna be the GASB 100. So who's gonna be affected by this? Well, any of you local governments out there who have a financial report that's um, done either on the modified cash basis or on a gap basis, this standard's gonna affect you. It affects those entities that have a year end of 630, 2024 or later. Um, so if you're a school district out there right now, and you are having to get uh, an audit or get your financial statements prepared, this standard is gonna to apply to you uh, since your year end just ended. And the reason why it's happening is the prior standard um, is over 50 years old. So the guys, we really just wanted to give this, give this concept a refresh and we'll go through some of those key changes here um, in this presentation. So there's a couple of classifications uh, that the standard covers accounting changes and error corrections. Uh, within accounting changes, you're going to have a change in accounting principle, a change in accounting estimate, or a change to or within the financial reporting entity. We'll cover each of those in the next few slides, or you could have an error correction. For a change in accounting principle, these are going to result from either a change from one generally accepted accounting principle to another generally accepted accounting principle. Um, the, the new principle that you're gonna use needs to be preferred over the old principle. And one way to kind of figure out is this a preferred principle or not, um, Gatsby gives a couple of, couple of ideas to go off of as far as qualitative characteristics. And that would be to look at is the new principle more understandable than the old one that you were using? Um, is it more reliable? Or maybe is it more consistent with, you know, the other governments that, that report just like you do? Um, the other piece of this for a change in accounting principle is going to be if there's new GASB guidance that comes, out, comes down the pike. Um, one of these will be the one I'll be talking about after um, GASB 100 with GASB 101. That's an update to the compensated absence standard, and that would fall under a change in accounting principle. Second type of accounting change is a change in accounting estimate. Now an accounting estimate is really something where there's subjectivity involved in the amount that's gonna be disclosed or reported in your financial statements. And a change in that estimate occurs when the inputs into that calculation change. So one of the things I didn't say with the accounting principle piece of it is an example of that is gonna be, I like to use capital assets. Um, is a good way for, to give an example. And within capital assets, you have depreciation. A, you, you, there's different types, different methods of depreciation that you can use. One could be a double declining balance, and maybe you're changing to a straight line method of depreciation. That's gonna be a, uh, that change in accounting principle where maybe that straight line depreciation is more preferable over the double declining balance. Well, within depreciation, you might have inputs um, that go into that. One such input is going to be your useful lives of your capital assets. This, you know, definitely um, matters as far as 
what your depreciation expense is going to be for the year. Maybe you have um, more experience that you've over the years that you've gathered where maybe you had a useful life policy for your equipment and it was 10 years, but over the past many years, you've realized, well, we're really only using that equipment for seven years. It's only lasting that long. We're going to change that input into our depreciation calculation. And that would be an example of a change in accounting estimate. This change should be justified. Um, and you know, the way it's gonna be justified is if one of those reasons being you have more experience with something, you have a way to better calculate um, whatever it is that you're calculating, such as depreciation expense. Next type of accounting change is a change to or within the financial reporting entity. There's various ways that this can happen, but one such uh, example would be removing a fund, uh, moving a fund from you know, being presented on its own and moving it into the general fund. Maybe there's no restricted revenue with it anymore that's gonna be coming in. So you move that fund into the general fund and that would be a change to or within the financial reporting entity. Another example is going to be a fund presentation change. So in your financial statements, for those of you that have financial report, reports prepared, you're going to have uh, major funds presented. And those major funds can change on a year-to-year -year basis based on meeting a specific criteria. And one of the criteria that GASB gives um, for governmental funds is if, you, if revenues, expenses, liabilities or assets of a particular fund is greater than 10% of the total of all funds for those categories, that fund now has to be presented as a major fund. Um, and this can change from year to year as far as what's going to be presented. Maybe one year you got a big grant for a fund and in that year you spent it all down. The next year you might have very little activity in that fund. So in one year it was presented as major because it met that 10% criteria. In the next, it was aggregated in with your non-major funds and was no longer uh, meeting that, that criteria um, to be reported as a major fund. So that is another change within the financial reporting entity. I think Mike Sher talked about this this morning, but you could have um, a discreetly presented component unit or a blended component unit and maybe the board of commissioners has created a new um, discreetly presented component unit. Maybe they've um, created a job development authority during the year. Well, that is also gonna qualify as a change to or within the financial reporting entity. And the other, the last bullet point there is you could have a, a component unit that switches from being a blended component unit to a discreetly presented component unit, just depending on what the circumstances um, were at your entity, and that would qualify as a change to or within the financial reporting entity as well. Error corrections. Um, this is going to differ from your accounting changes. It, you know, it sounds just like it is that you had an error in your prior report. Um, this can be from various things. You know, we're all human. We make mathematical errors uh, from time to time. You could have a calculation problem in your, maybe you, in one of your Excel documents that's calculating your depreciation. Maybe it's not summing all the way down and it's found out in a later reporting period. Um, that would be a mathematical error that would result in a error correction. Maybe you've misapplied accounting principles. GASB 87 was a, you know, pretty tough um, standard to apply. And maybe when you were applying that standard, you came across a lease agreement where it looked like it was cancelable by both parties at any time. So you consider that a short term lease. Well, maybe a year goes down the road and you look at that lease agreement again and you realize, oh, it's really actually wasn't cancelable by both parties at any time. It was really only cancelable by one party. Now all of a sudden you got to reevaluate that lease to see, did it actually qualify as a lease under 87? And now do I need to um, restate my financial statements? Because at that point, it's going to be an error if it really did qualify as a lease and you, you just didn't apply the, the accounting principle correctly in the year that you implemented that standard. Or you could misuse facts. All those items um, can result in an error correction. So now that I've talked about the different types 
of accounting changes and error corrections. I'll kind of go through each one as far as what the accounting and financial reporting looks like if you have any of these um, happen to you during any reporting period. So if you have a change in accounting principle, uh, if, you, if you present single period financial statements, which a lot of you do, some of you do comparative or you know, do two year audits, so you're presenting two years worth of data. But if you're doing a single period and you have a change in accounting principle, the, the principle is gonna be applied retroactive, meaning you're gonna restate your beginning net position or fund balance. Um, you're not actually gonna go into the prior period and reopen that audit and restate anything within there, but you are gonna restate your beginning net position in the current um, financial statements. If you do have comparative statements, you will restate the earliest period that's being presented, but you, could, you get to look at practicality. If it's not gonna be practical um, to restate those earlier periods, you know, make sure you document your reasoning for why it's not practical, talk to your auditor um, and figure out what the best course of action is gonna be there. If you have a change in accounting estimate, you're gonna to wanna to report this prospectively. This is a difference from the change in accounting principle. With estimates, you're not gonna go back um, and restate anything. Here, you're just going to apply the new estimate going forward in the period when that change occurs. If you have a change to or within the financial reporting entity, it's gonna be similar to the change in accounting principle where you're gonna adjust your current periods, net position or fund balance, and you're gonna make this change. You're gonna act like this change occurred in the beginning of the period, even if it happened two thirds of the way through the year. One thing for the change to or within the financial reporting period or the financial reporting entity is if you have a merger or acquisition that results in a new component unit being added to your financial statements, um, the standard is not actually going to apply to that particular transaction. You'd want to look at GASB 69 that um, talks about mergers and acquisitions. That's just a little side note for you. It doesn't happen very often, but if it does, it's good, a good piece of information to know. For error corrections, um, you are going to report this retroactive. You're going to restate your beginning balance if it's a single period. If it's comparative, you're going to restate any period that's being presented. So a little bit different there than the change in accounting principle where you have a little bit, little bit of um, discretion in changing the prior periods that are being presented. With every GASB standard comes note disclosures. And a lot of these note disclosures aren't too much different from the old way that you would do a, um, a prior period adjustment or a change in accounting principle. But I'll go through the differences with each of these types of transactions. So if you have a change in accounting principle, you're going to want to disclose the nature of the change, the reason for the change, and any of the effects on your beginning balances, whether it's net position or fund balance. If you have a change in accounting estimate, you are going to want um, to disclose the nature of the change, any of the financial statement line items that were affected, and you also disclose the reason for the change. You don't have to disclose the reason for the change if the new or the change in accounting estimate is due to a new GASB pronouncement that came out. They scope that out where you don't have to include that in the notes. Um, if you have a change to or within the financial reporting entity, again, here you're gonna disclose the nature of the change, the reason for the change, and the various effects on beginning balances. With the one instance that I talked about with made the major fund presentation changing, that's one area where you don't have to disclose the reason for the change, since it does, it's just no longer meeting that criteria from GASB 34. And if you have a error correction, Again, here you're gonna disclose the nature of the error and its correction, the, the line items um, that were affected by the error in the prior period, what the effects were on the prior, the change of the prior period net position had the change not occurred, as well as the effects on the beginning balances of net position, fund balance, depending on you know, which funds were affected and so on. 
few other reporting requirements with uh, GASB 100, one of which is for reclassifications. If you have a reclassification that doesn't actually result in a change in fund balance or net position needing to be made, maybe it's just a, um, a change, there was a line item, a specific line item in your financial statements that needed to be reclassified. If it results from a change in accounting principle, again, here you're gonna disclose the nature of the change, and as well as um, the reason for that change. In comparative statements, these should be reclassified um, for all periods presented, if practicable. If the reclassification is from an error correction, you're going to disclose that nature of the change, as well as reclassify amounts in the prior period that are due to this change. Uh, for the financial statements, the aggregate amount of all adjustments can be shown as one line on, say, your statement of activities. You, you can aggregate them all together if you have multiple error corrections, accounting changes. Um, you can show it as one line within each reporting unit. So, you know, if you have errors in your statement of activities, you'd have a, a line item there at the bottom for the, the aggregate amount of the adjustments. Same thing if you have, if the error came from the general fund, you'd, you'd show that error um, as an aggregate amount in the general fund. You can list them all uh, separately within the financial statements, but that can make it, you know, a little bit convoluted in the statements, make them a little less clean. So if you don't, if you just aggregate them in the statements, then you can separate them uh, in the note disclosures. And within those notes, you would report it all the changes that were made in a table format. Um, you're going to put what the original beginning balance was what the error or change in accounting uh, accounting change was, and you would list all of them separately, list all the effects on the various funds um, or or, net, or government wide statements, and then what the what the ending um, restated balance would be. There's also changes for, for, from this standard. You could have RSI or SI that's affected. RSI being your required supplementary information that's included in your financial report, or SI, which is your supplementary information. If you have a change in accounting principle during the year for RSI and SI, you're just going to restate the year that's being presented in the financial statements. You'll restate those amounts. Um, you don't have to go back and restate other other years. Same thing with the change to or within the financial reporting entity. It's going to be this similar situation. However, if you have an error correction, you would go and change any years that were affected as long as it's practicable. If it's not practical, um, you should disclose why it's not practical to restate. And then you need to identify what items were restated versus which items were not restated. So I know that was a lot of information um, jam-packed into a few slides, but here I have a, a slide for you to reference um, anytime, and it kind of breaks down the different types, what they are, gives some examples, um, how to account for them, what, what note disclosures need to be included, and what, what happens with RSI and SI. And this would just be a good tool for you to come back to, I mean, always you know, go back to GASB 100 if you have questions with your stand with the standard, or talk to your auditor, um, or reach out to our office. So that was a little bit about GASB 100. Emily, how are we doing on time? Good. All right. So GASB 101, and this is going to be a change in accounting principle, like we just discussed. This is going to um, affect all of you who have a year end after December 15th of 2024. So for you school districts that just had your reporting period close, you're not gonna have to worry about this standard until next year. If you are a city or a county or any entity that has financial statements reported and it's gonna have a year end of December 31st, 2024, this standard will apply to you as long as you are getting a gap audit. And we'll go over some key changes here. I mean, the this standard, it's an update to GASB 16, which was the previous um, compensated absence standard. There's a few 
I'd call them minor tweaks um, to the standard. So it's definitely, there's a change and it's good to know what those, what those changes were. And so we'll talk about those um, here as we go forward. So first I'll give you a little bit of a definite, couple key definitions that are in the standard. Uh, the first one is compensated absence. And this is gonna be for leave that an employee has earned that's either gonna be paid out in cash when the employee uses the leave, or it's gonna be paid out at another time in cash, such as uh, when an employee retires and they, they've earned that leave and now they're gonna, they're gonna get a cash payment uh, when they leave employment. Or maybe it's gonna be where a specific leave is gonna be converted um, to a defined benefit post-employment benefit plan. This type of uh, compensated absence generally do not have a set payment schedule. Uh, they can be settled during employment or after employment. Uh, some key, some big examples, the most common ones are gonna be your paid time off if you have PTO or your annual leave, your sick leave. Some other ones that we might not always think about are parental leave, uh, military leave or sabbatical leave. And for sabbatical leave, it kind of comes down to whether or not you're do, still having to do something for the government when you're on sabbatical leave, or whether you're really just on a, you know, a, a hiatus for a little while, you're getting paid, but you're not having to actually do something specific for the government. If you're having to do something extra, maybe it's just a different job for a little while, that's not gonna be considered sabbatical leave. Um, it's only when you, or it's not gonna be considered a compensated absence. It's only when you don't have to do anything um, and you're still gonna get that sabbatical leave, that's when that's gonna be considered a um, compensated absence. Termination of employment, I mean, that that's, sounds pretty self-explanatory. It's basically when you're, when you're done working at the organization, you, you've, left, you've left your employment with the, with the government. So a little joke that I found here, and it, it says, are you really keeping track of my time, at, time off requests on your hand? Well, only until I can transfer it to my permanent system. Now, I really hope that all of you out there have a better way of tracking your employees' compensated absence than writing it on your hand or writing it on the blackboard behind you. Um, that is definitely going to cause you issues down the road. So if, if you don't have a good system in place to track all of your employees' leave, please you know, use some kind of Excel, some kind of software to track your, track your compensated absence so you can, it can assist you then in figuring out this standard. And your auditor won't get upset with you either. Um, so there's three types or three things that will be included in your compensated absence. You're either going to have unused leave that you've earned, you're going to have used leave, but unpaid. So in this case, think about it as you have a calendar year end of 1231 for your reporting purposes and employees take off during Christmas, salaries getting paid or their, you know, their payroll is getting paid in January. They've taken the leave, but they haven't actually been paid it yet. So that's going to have to be included as part of the, the measurement of your liability. And then with that, you also have salary related payments, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit, but those also get added to your liability calculation. For unused leave, it needs to be for services that are already rendered. Um, basically the employee has earned that leave. They don't have to do anything else um, to get it. It's accu it accumulates. So if you have leave where at the end of the year or at the end of the reporting period, um, the leave goes back to zero. So it's kind of a use it or lose it type situation. That's not gonna, um, you're not gonna use that then in determining a liability for your unused leave. And it needs to have a greater than not chance of being paid out. So that's basically just a hair shy of being greater than 50% chance of being used or paid out. And that will all go into your um, unused leave determination to figure out if this compensated absence is really gonna have a liability attached to it. Um, I would say that this is gonna be the trickiest part uh, of the standard is figuring out, do I have, is there really more than 50% chance of it being used or paid out? You know, for some of you, it might be really easy if all you have is vacation leave 
and that vacation leave is going to be paid out at termination, well, then it's either it's basically a hundred percent chance that it's either going to be used or paid out. So you don't have to try to figure the greater than 50% chance piece out there. But if you have say sick leave and sick leave doesn't get paid out at termination, but employees still are going to use the sick leave while they're here, uh, you have, you know, less than a 50% chance that it's going to get paid out at the end of their term but there might be a greater than 50% chance that a particular portion of the sick leave is going to be used. So you would have to factor that into your calculation. Um, the biggest thing here that I can give you tips on is look at your policy manuals to figure out what kind of leave do you have? What are the you know, key terms of, of the leave? How is it going to be paid out? How is it going to be used? Um, and look at your historical data that's maybe going to be the best starting point anyway, is seeing, you know, historically 20 to 25% of our sick leave is used on an annual basis. Um, that, that, that might be the best point of uh, reference for you. Uh, maybe not, maybe his, the historical data doesn't actually give you uh, what's going to happen in the future, but it might be a good starting point for a lot of you out there. few other things with the unused leave. If you um, have a defined benefit post-employment conversion at the end of, at the end of um, an employee's term, that's not going to be considered in part of, as part of the unused leave calculation. If you have leave that only occurs with sporadic events, um, here I like to think of the, the parental leave or the maternity leave. Because that affects just a small subset of individuals each year, you don't have to include sporadic event type leave until the leave actually commences. So if you think of someone who's on maternity leave, you're only going to start uh, recording a liability for that maternity leave once the person actually goes on maternity leave. So, you know, if they get 12 weeks, it's December 1st and they've left on maternity leave, maybe there's eight weeks left that you would then include as part of your uh, liability calculation. If they didn't start until January 1st and your reporting period is 1231, that's not going to be included because the leave hasn't actually commenced as of your reporting period. If you have unlimited PTO or you have holiday leave that's non-discretionary, just meaning that you don't have any holiday leave that can be moved from one day to another. Some organizations out there might have um, some floating holidays. If you have it where it's non-discretionary or you have unlimited leave, those are also two types of leave that would not be considered in your compensated absence um, balance. Now that we've kind of figured out what are the different types of comp potential compensated absences and we need to calculate a liability for it, we need to figure out how are we going to measure that liability. Just like in the in GASB 16, you would use the employee's pay rate at the date of the financial statements um, to calculate that liability based on their portion of the unused leave. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, if you know for a fact that the, the pay rate that's used today is not going to be what the liability is going to be based off of. So let's say your sick leave policy is that you pay out at the end of a term or at the end of the employee's um, work with the, with the organization that they, you'll, you'll use 20% of their final pay rate to determine what they're going to get paid out at termination. Well, with that, you would use 20% then of the employee's current pay rate of the data financial statements because you know that it's not going to be 100% paid. It's going to be 20% uh, of the employee's pay rate. Or let's say you have use leave, but it's unpaid. In that case, you're going to use what the actual cash payment was because um, you'll know that by the time you're doing the, doing the financial statements. Once you've calculated the liability for the unused leave or the used but unpaid leave, then there's going to be salary-related payments. 
Um, salary related payments doesn't just mean like if for, it's for salary employees. You might have hourly employees that this is going to um, take part, take place in as well. With the um, salary related payments, you know, this is going to be a type of payment that's paid in addition to the actual compensated absence that occurs. The main example that I can think of is going to be your FICA taxes or your Social Security and Medicare taxes that you pay on a normal basis for people's salary. If you if the person uses the leave, you're also paying FICA taxes. Um, same thing with when they when they terminate employment, you might pay those FICA taxes as well. So you want to make sure you include those salary related payments as part of your as part of your calculation. The Salary related payment needs to be direct, directly related to the amount that's actually getting paid out um, for the leave. So, you know, in the case of FICA payment, that's 7.65% of whatever the salary is that you're paying. And it needs to be incrementally um, associated with the leave. I have the word indirect up there, but it should be incremental um, association, which just means that an extra payment is being is having to be made on behalf of the government because of the compensated absence that you're receiving or that the employee is going to be receiving. And just like um, just like the, the measurement of the compensated absence liability for the unused leave, it's going to be similar here for the salary related payments. You're going to use the, the, the known payment or the known salary at that time, the pay rate at that time to figure out your measurement. Uh, let's see. Go to the next slide here for post-employment benefits. This is a kind of just a separate carve out that they have um, in this standard where if you have a distribution to an individual account and that distribution is going to be, so it's not actually going to the employee, it's going to an employee's um, account and it's going to be used for specified purposes. So in this case, think of sick leave at the end of termination or at the end of employment that's going to be moved into some kind of account that's going to be paid for just health care premiums. This would also be considered um, a compensated absence that needs to be part of the liability if it's, there's a greater than 50% chance that it's actually going to occur. And you would, you would measure it the same um, just like you would uh, the normal unused leave. For the notes, um, I'll say like Gasby kind of threw financial prepare as a bone here and the fact that you're, the standard is actually decreasing what you need to have in the notes. Um, so that's always, that's always nice is if you're the financial statement preparer out there or if you're the auditor. In the past, you always had to disclose separately the amount of increases to the liability, compensated absence liability, as well as the decreases. Now you can choose from either doing the separate increase and decrease, or you can just net them together and report a net increase decrease. If you do the net increase decrease, um, you just need to disclose in the notes that this is a, a net amount. And in the past, you also had to disclose the liquidating fund um, that was going to be used for paying the compensated absence. You know, maybe it's the general fund that's going to pay the, the vacation leave for the employees or maybe it's the road and bridge fund. You no longer have to disclose the, the liquidating fund that's gonna be used. So I'll have a couple examples um, for everyone that, that Gatsby gives. They're, the first one is gonna be for paid time off. So in this example, the paid time off is earned every single month. It carries over without limits. So you're not, you know, you're not resetting at the end of each year and it's, the unused leave is paid upon termination. So if we think of the three requirements um, that would be considered in determining whether there's a liability for a compensated absence, well, it's hit the, the requirement that it's earned, that it accumulates, and that it's greater than 50% chance of being paid out because in this case, it's paid out upon termination. Um, so whether they use it during the year or they're going to get paid out on termination, it's basically 100% chance that it's going to get paid out. So the result is that you're going to report a liability for the full amount. So just to give kind of a really basic um, calculation example for you, if you had 10 employees 
who each had 100 hours of PTO at the end of the year. In total, you have 1,000 hours of PTO that is going to be susceptible to accrual for a compensated absence balance. This, let's just say for simplicity purposes that the average pay rate for all those employees is $10 an hour. Now you're looking at a, a liability of $10,000 for um, the PTO, plus you're going to need to add that 7.65% for FICA if that's the only um, salary-related payment that you have. And that's going to be what you would then report in the financial statements for the PTO compensated absence liability. Another example is sick leave. In this case, it's earned each month. It carries over without limits, but it's not paid upon termination. So the wrinkle here is that it's not going to be paid. So you have to now look at your 50% calculation or, you know, is it more likely than not to be used during the year? And maybe kind of like as the example that I gave in the past where it was 25% of your leave of your sick leave is usually used during the year. Well, now you'll take that calculation that we did before, but instead of using 100% of it, you're going to use 25%. Another example, again, here, it's, it's using sick leave, but in this one, it doesn't carry over at the end of each fiscal year. So because it doesn't carry over, it's not accumulating anymore. And so no liability is going to need to be reported for that, for that sick leave. So think about those, the facts here again, as example three, where it's earned each month, doesn't carry over. Um, and the unused leave is not paid upon termination. But on there, a little wrinkle to that could be that, okay, the leave doesn't carry over at the end of each calendar year, but you actually run on a fiscal year. So at the end of your fiscal year, you are going to have, your employees are still going to have sick leave available to them. So at that point, you're going to have to figure out how much sick leave is more likely than not to be used or paid before the end of the calendar year to determine. And that part of it would be included as part of your compensated absence liability. And the last example that I have for you is, let's just say you have annual leave, but 100% of the annual leave give, is given to employees on the first day of the year. Um, it's earned throughout, but the employee gets it in the beginning of the year. And it's reconciled if the employee leaves, meaning if they you know, leave halfway through the year, they've only actually earned half. So they might have to pay some of that leave back if they, if they didn't use it all or if they used more than what they had actually earned. Um, or maybe they're going to get paid out the portion that they, they did earn but hadn't used yet. In this case, the unused leave carries over at the end of each fiscal year and it is paid upon termination. Well, in this case, even though, you know, the facts changed a little bit where the employee earns the leave throughout the year, it's, it, they're given the leave at the beginning of the year, but they earn it throughout because your financial reporting period ended at the end of the year. Your employees have actually earned all the leave that was initially given to them. So any of that that was not used yet, that's going to be included as part of your liability. And that is the last example that I have for you. I appreciate everyone out there for paying attention today and, and coming to this this wonderful GASB training that we have. I know it's always one of the most exciting topics of the day. Uh, Sherry Niece is up next, and she's going to do an awesome job talking to you guys about procurement. If you do have any questions, you can throw them in the chat. You can always email me, um, and we'd be happy to help. Thanks, everyone.